Tamir from DLT Ledgers on Trade Finance Digitization. Please join me in welcoming him on stage. Thank you. So good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Sameek. Uh, today I'm going to discuss on you know, what's happening in the trade finance world. Uh, can you hear? So on trade finance digitization. You know, so I I often wonder, we always be you know, we, we always have these cameras with which has this circular uh, you know lenses and but we always see the pictures as a rectangle. Trade finance viewed from the point of view of corporates, uh, large commodity traders and brands, and ordinary finance guys. And in the in the later world, you know, we find lots of funds being formulated for financing. Um, they all view the financing part and the trade part in a in, in from the point of view of uh, you know, uh, their own uh, ecosystems which they work with. So. Uh, DLT Ledgers is a platform which looks at from different point of view uh, into those trade finance digitization processes for these organizations. So we work with uh, quite a number of banks, uh, we work with uh, corporates, we work with large commodity trading organizations uh, in terms of uh, the digitization process and what are the benefits and ROIs which they get as a part of their activity. So in today's uh, discussion I will be sharing a few customer experiences. Um, and discussing uh, in terms of what uh, is happening with blockchain and those customers. Um, so prior to that, we'll take a quick dive into what we do uh, as an organization. Uh, so we, we started off in Singapore like three years back. So we have uh, near to $1.5 billion trade uh, financed globally across 28 countries. Uh, and we work with uh, quite a lot of corporates, you know, so we have around 380 odd, you know, this shows 360, um, where we try to digitize their uh, trade finance activities and trade digitization activities, you know, which runs, which marries with the fund, uh, the leasing or maybe the fund organizations, um, and try to marry them as a group. And we sell to banks, we sell to corporates, and we sell to alternative financing as a platform. So we don't fund. We remain away from the funding activities, you know, which is our ambition for the future. <coughs> and uh, it, 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 so, in today's discussion, I would rather uh, look at how I can uh, discuss on a cross-border trade transaction and what is the kind of financing which goes inside and how it gets data-driven in terms of a futuristic process and, uh, on the trade side. You know, so, and then. The second uh, case example which I would look at is on logistics frameworks um, on supplier financing, which is more like a PO and inventory financing for supplier logistics frameworks. And SME financing, which is a hot topic in many countries and how you know, this is addressed within the platform. And also I would uh, rather look at uh, the last one, which is sustainability financing and how a consortium of banks or financial institutions and how the reporting can happen as a part of it on sustainability. Uh, back to these uh, financing organizations which has financed uh, to these uh, companies. So in most of these, you know, we early enough we found that it's actually strangers dealing with strangers. So you have all the issues which comes across. Like since you are in fintech, I don't want to give you detailed explanations on fraud detections and what it means by authorization and source for a trade transaction or maybe a financing transaction at the suppliers and um, or when it comes into uh, a kind of a uh, data authentication, you know, which is required. Uh, document securitization, what does it mean? Um, and also, how this works together so that we can give better financing based on data. The traditional financing has always been on balance sheet payments and cash flows and organizing that around, but that doesn't mean that the company will go out of business in the future. So the risk of the business is always uh, related to its current performance and its futuristic standard, how we collect those information so that you know, we can have an uh, easy lending process you know, from a lending organization. Um, wow. yeah. So when we, when we look at it, uh, the, the, the structured processes in the past have been looking at the flow of money in most of these cases. So the banks have been the center of these flow of money transactions and every organization used to support 
what is required for the financial requirements of the banks. So, what we when we looked at this issue like three years back, you know, we wanted to bring in the document flows integrated to the bank flows, which uh, also needs to be integrated to the physical flows of these uh, uh, materials. Like you know, whether on a inventory financing, whether the inventory changes have been recorded in a logistics framework, in a trade, whether the inventory has moved from one point to the other, and also. We need to look at it more from a point of view of uh, the flow of contracts, you know, because many contracts uh, across the world um, has different patterns and parameters which changes over time. So there are uh, penultimate contracts may not look like the original contracts. So there is lots of di differential variations which will come. So how we can make the contract conditions in smart contracts very relevant and very real time in terms of these organizations? So. The concept of DLT ledgers is about how we integrate these processes together so that lending can be made much faster and all these data collections that goes to the usage of the circular uh, into a rectangular viewpoint of each organization you know, uh, which looks at it from a lending point of view. Now, um, you know, it uses all these platform parameters. What you see on top, I don't want you to read it, but what you see on top is actually all those code bases which has been built around blockchain from starting with smart contract which is a contract formulation how you formulate a network you know so that you can do your job and then how you actually look at uh, there is a product called as DFC on securing of your documents and the second row actually looks at all the connectivity parameters you know which you have um, and also the AI parameters in terms of fraud detection and how you can stop the circular funding in the trade process and how you could uh, bring across um, better visibility to the bank in terms of a tracking process. Um, and those uh, are many of the modules. You know, we, we call them as uh, the engines you know, which runs DLT ledgers. And uh, there are few engines used by maybe a commodity trader. There are few engines used by a supplier financing model. There are few engines used by an SME financing model. So I'll take examples of these and discuss with you. And uh, uh, you know we work with open APIs, you know, so that uh, we can work with the banks, you know, which has open APIs, and also their restricted APIs, you know, which comes as a part of it. And we welcome every country which announces open APIs, so that we get more funding transfer requirements directly for the customers to have control at their hands. And so, um, and we have a uh, we have an excellent consensus engine which has a patent right on it, which looks at um, document consensus between multiple parties. I believe that the BL, you know, as it is seen in the past, will move further into a consensus process because it's much cheaper and you can operate from your mobile device. We still use BLs, you know, which were the BL solutions digitally, which was created like 30 years back from Swift offshoots and, uh, you know, we have 15 years back technologies and all, where we didn't have the kind of connectivities and the kind of uh, levels of uh, devices, you know, which can be used to be minimal cost for the trader. Because the trader works with less than a a percentage, you know, basis point, and you can see in a trade, a lot of people come in and grab, you know, that out of the traders. You know, so how can we help the traders in that? So, so the first one which I'll address, you know, so I have three. One is a cross-border trade. I look into supplier financing. I'm taking a case example of a customer and trying to explain this across to you. So, uh, imagine a trade which happens from, uh, I think. Uh, uh, maybe Bangladesh uh, to Dubai, uh, and the ports which are there is Singapore and Jabal Ali port. To be frank, you know, I have not digitized any ports. So the BL document actually is a physical document. But I have actually digitized and made the, the faster transactions in terms of LC, receivable financing, and payable financing for these customers, saving them 10 to 15 days on a 120 million, 10 million running on a monthly basis. So you obviously save X amount of money in terms of the transactions, in terms of the trade side. Now, when this happens, the the, the, the corporate actually create the the contract within the environment, and you know, and then network all the parties, which is their supplier networking, and for the corporate actually it goes further and further. It grows as a solution so that they can network all their suppliers and customers together. And then there is rapid financing which comes out of the banks, you know, which are in the ecosystem, which I discussed about around 40 banks. Yesterday we signed uh, Af uh, one of the largest uh, African bank, which is Trade Development Bank in Africa. Uh, there is an AIF conference going on in Africa similar to this. So that connects us to 27 banks in, uh, in, in Africa. And we have more uh, connectivities coming with uh, other banks, you know, which uh, 
by which we will have the agri processes uh, arising out of Asia to Japan is getting financed across. A simple example is an LC transfer which can be digitized and gives uh, the information to the multiple banks and directly to the customer. So there is no calling back into the bank and asking, has my LC arrived? Can you confirm it? You know, those kind of stuff. You know, so. And, uh, you know, maybe really, uh, uh, a case example, you know, quick one on one of the large traders, you know, uh, this is more of efficiency building. Larger corporate organizations wanted better efficiencies in terms of their trade process, integrating and networking uh, their internal, uh, you know, processes and intercompany activity, which can lead into a digital inter intercompany activity and the banks come in between. Second example is more of uh, a trustless uh, framework where the buyer and the seller are two different entities and then there is no trust activity happening except a contract. And then you find all your sales contracts and commercial invoices, uh, rodent certifications, you know, the all kinds of certifications which come from surveyors and shippers, which comes into the trade processes, which get completely digitized from the source and authenticates as a part of it. Now, what, what does it deliver? It delivers, uh, in this trade, for example, the if the Singapore is a high seas trade, it doesn't, the document doesn't have to flow to Singapore. It can flow from Indonesia directly across to the Indian buyer. And it saves around 10 to 15 days. Um, and the transaction, uh, you know, the, the, the ship, uh, the shipment probably will reach before the documents, you know, so we can avoid that that benefit for the customer. And the digital uh, base on which the high seas trade is done in Singapore get financed by the digital banks based on the digital records, you know, which is there. There is a type of indemnification which is uh, routed again on the authorizations which needs to be given on the platform. There is a number of trades which is happening, you know, based on this and uh, we have recently done an amelization trade where we have uh, given a almost one to 1.5 million dollars back to the customer in terms of an annual basis, which is a good ROI. Now these are some uh, immediate benefits. You know there are, uh, you know if you Google it out, you know you'll find uh, on DLT ledgers, you know you'll find these press releases where the customers have come out with uh, real benefits, you know which they gained out of it. So uh, I know that we all hear a lot about blockchain and then a lot on payment side, but on the a commercial banking side, you know, or on the uh, on the trade side, you know, so there is quite a lot of uh, benefits which the customers can get as a part of the process. The same goes with banks because of their operational costs, which I'll come into it later on. And the banks come into play, you know, you know, you know, the last bit of it is smart payment. The banks come into play in terms of financing these trade. From a trader point of view, they can have uh, a number of banks, uh, you know, which they deal with. Uh, automatically, you know, the trade uh, information and the ask for the information with multiple rates on credit lines can go to these banks and then they respond back and then it goes all the way to the settlement side. Um, so the next one, uh, 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 you know, probably... This is the very first bank in Singapore to build an entire supply chain in an ecosystem using a blockchain technology and APIs together to fill the gap in supply chain networks, which is traceability and transparency where uh, every commodity is a supply chain solution provider. Essentially, we are the green grocer to a whole bunch of uh, FMCG uh, companies, food manufacturer in Bangladesh, food distributor in India, or a pea protein uh, manufacturer in, in China. They would talk to us for all their raw material requirements. It was actually a mutual collaboration with both the solution now in transparency and visibility. We worked the all end to end solution from the very partition all the way to the end user. So th this is one example with a bank, and uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, you can find it in YouTube. It's a longer version, you know, so this like cut down from five minutes to like thirty seconds. Uh, and then uh, maybe let me get into a data-driven supply financing model. So that's on the trade finance side, and the data is collected. The banks get take advantage of it, and then it gets completely interfaced on a trade transaction point of view. The banks get all the benefits of tracking the trade and understanding at what point it is and then supporting the trade you know, at all points of time, pre-shipment all the way to post-shipment and the final, uh, you know, if there is a activity towards the uh, supplier point, you know, to the buyer point, you know, there are more structured financing side, it can help them uh, track the entire process from one end to the other. Now, coming into supplier financing, uh, which is an area which is uh, where we are actually working with uh, larger uh, logistics companies. Uh, for them, the ambition is uh, the data for financing is sitting with these logistics companies, whether it's a PO or an inventory, which they keep and how this data can be utilized 
for financing purposes. So this data needs to be authenticated to avoid fraud and uh, make sure in terms of the financing organizations that they have the right information. So I'm just taking an example out here. Uh, uh, when, when we when we look at uh, you know a, a network you know for a logistics organization, uh, we find that there are buyers of or the lenders which comes in. Uh, the buyers are maybe take an example of Nike. Nike is ordering shoes across to a large logistics company, and the logistics company is asking its suppliers or Nike is ordering with its suppliers with information to the logistics company. So we are bringing those suppliers and the supplier supplier if it's a PO based kind of financing and routing those POs and transactions on a variability basis within the platform. So the first step is to create that network. So there is an onboarding activity on how these suppliers needs to be onboarded and how this buyer needs to be onboarded and then the logistics framework sitting with the API information for all the data which they collect as a part of their transaction. So the first step in it is to look at the suppliers. Now the suppliers traditionally had uh, given across who is my dad, who is my mom, and uh, you know they have all kinds of uh, credit scoring information, which comes as a part of their balance sheets, P and Ls. You know probably they don't, you know, literally they don't have a business to grow, but still you know they are a strong supplier because they have been a supplier in the past, and that's how people have lost money. So we look at a performance dashboard, which is about on top of the credit dashboard, credit scoring, where the, the logistics company as well as the buyer is going to vet the supplier. So when you have multiple buyers vetting the supplier, the chances that the supplier's on time, uh, supplier's uh, rejection rates, you know, um, the, the level of uh, cash flow at the supplier's end can be collected and authenticated across the framework. And that, that's what is being done in the first step. And, uh, the next step is uh, the process. So once an order comes in, and that order goes across to, uh, is placed across to the uh, from the buyer across to the uh, across to the supplier, and then the information goes into the logistics and how this is being tracked and invoices being raised, and uh, you know, yeah, and all the changes. And maybe uh, there is a PO raised by a buyer, but the PO can get cancelled. There will be a partial PO release as uh, from the case of an inventory. Um, now, how can you track this manually? It is impossible. And you need to track this if you have to pay or lend to a supplier. You need valid information which comes in and the changes which are there needs to be recorded as a part of this process. So that's what uh, is, is being done. And then, uh, and the order and supplier and then the whole process starts to work. I'm not going to explain this. I think you, you know it. The whole process starts to work from a supplier uh, inventory and then the inventory is getting loaded or imagine it's a PO level and then inventory is getting loaded and then uh, it is managed by the logistics. The clear problem here is the supplier keeps the inventory as a redemption stock within the logistics uh, warehouses and once the order is made like we are booking an Apple computer the order is delivered across to the uh, to the customer and then uh, the for example if it's Nike it's like thousand shoe, pairs of shoes they have a 180 days payment term with the supplier. So the supplier is getting like a 360 day kind of a no money situation in terms of what he has done. Or maybe a 60 days or a 90 days or 180 days. So this payment process, you know, how we can support the working capital. We can support it only if we track the data and then we authenticate it and give the results back to the respective guys in there. So the next one. And uh, you know, so uh, we, we look at uh, you know all these information in terms of POs, DOs, you know, invoices, which is integrated across. You know, there is a complete RPA machine which works and then makes sure it interfaces and gets the information from the respective uh, organizations. And then uh, we have the ledgers, you know, which holds the data, which is authenticated. And those authenticated data is the one you know which probably we can take it for financing with bonds. And once it is authenticated, um, then the banks and non-banks and alternative financing guys and maybe funds can come in to start financing those information into you know, or maybe start financing those suppliers as a supplier financing model. So that's one of the uh, critical aspect of supplier financing uh, activity. You know, so which uh, is something you know which we work with large logistics companies for that. The third one is SME financing. You know, which is a 
in which is like uh, you know the only difference we do for alternative financing guys is we have a vet uh, on a bank grade document which is securitized it's not an invoice without a contract it's not an invoice without uh, you know, without a buyer on the other end so we actually look at you know the counterparty and we securitize these documents and those securitized documents they uh, can go in as a part of ask in terms of the lending processes and uh, you know th there is an entire process by which all consented documents which is uh, uh, a particular maybe in my next slide you know so you'll be able to see that uh, you know they are asking for the particular rates and uh, you know these consensus process happens in blockchain between uh, the parties the buyer seller and also the contracted parties so that they'll be able to securely store this and view this and it, it is stamp approved in terms of and it's as per UNC trial and you know ETA rules you know, which exist for digital transformation. So these authenticated and validated uh, uh, information uh, helps us to make sure that every bit of information passed across for the lending requirements are actually taken care of by the blockchain in terms of the multi-party consensus which comes as a part of it. You can see there is a small uh, you know uh, uh, you know there is a there is a crypt which is generated you know which probably can be broken by rule by 100 years of computing you know, so that's because of the multi-party consensus if you even change open change the date or change uh, the date parameters take over and then the complete document is tamp tampered and then it, it cannot be used and then so the same exists in a trade case for the 55 documents which is passed across and then that's where all these banks come in and then start the financing of the bank side and it's tracked uh, completely. The visibility of the tracking goes into the lending organizations, whether if it's a bank or a non-bank organizations, and then they get all the uh, information in terms of the track side of uh, you know, the, the, the transaction. And this can go down for sustainability financing to the farmer level. Um, and that's mobility and nothing to do with blockchain. And mobility and then those get recursive uh, bookings into the blockchain and then it, it comes as a part of the sustainability process. You know, so so that's the uh, you know that's the three uh, you know sharing of information which I wanted to do today in terms of cross border trade digitization supplier financing and also SME financing and uh, when it comes into banks and trade finance digitization organizations you know I am looking at it from the bank's point of view there is a whole set of uh, information which they get in terms of the lending side so that can be adopted by alternative financing companies or banks or maybe funds or you know the different guys you know which we work with uh, you know as a part of the process now they they, they look at uh, you know what is the auto trigger point from the customer and how can they support it with uh, receivable financing payable financing uh, where there's an LC discounting process you know, across the banks um, and we have recently got into structured financing for larger trade in terms of long-term trade transactions which happens as a part of uh, government buy-ins in many countries. You know, so. And the immediate ROI which we have witnessed in these banks is all about uh, reduction of their operational cost because they don't need to eyeball. You know, the, even today, you know, their trade documents or respective documents needs to be taken to the tellers in the bank. You know, so we have we have avoided it. You know, we, are, we have given that benefit to the bank. Um, and also, you know, we have tried to make sure that uh, you know all parties on that and human errors and ops cost reductions are met as a part of the process. Um, fraud detection on our AI on counterparties. You know, if the counterparty is in Africa or some other bank, we look at the KYC of the counterparty, submit it to the bank on the host country, so that you have an entire visibility across the activity you know, which you are doing. Um, and probably, you know, uh, in you know, we, we started off small and we started to work with our customers, delivering value to our customers. We spent less time on conferences and meetings and uh, only after two years we came out and said this is what we have done. So uh, we work with a number of banks and we work with a number of customers um, and we have a larger ecosystem. We have connectivities to ERPs which is certified by SAPs, Microsofts and all for getting in at the source in terms of the documents. So we always track in terms of the source in terms of most of these documents. So these banks work with our customers and they have nodal networks you know, which helps them to get the point of information which is true across the ledgers you know, so they can finance those transactions. Um, so that's where uh, you know we have sorted uh, to an extent 
uh, from a financing point of view uh, into all these transactions which happens within a corporate or within a bank in the trade finance scenario. So now we are uh, uh, venturing into, uh, you know, or maybe now we are busy, our engineers are busy trying to see how we can uh, create the digital deal for the future. So there are four or five projects like that, you know, which uh, we wanted to automate the ports and also support the shipping. We work with all the traditional guys like Boleros or Musk or, you know, Musk Finance, you know, a lot of guys in the market just to make sure that, you know, we exist with the traditional world to be realistic and uh, we move towards a newer world offering solutions to the traditional world so that you know we, we can be adopted much much faster than any banks. Now if there are, uh, you know, since it's a fintech, I thought you know if there is any banking community you know, who wants to, wants to come in, it's a very easy process, we don't have a hard uh, uh, you know, IT related kind of uh, delivery across to any of these organizations. It is, uh, it is a simple plug and play into the environment and you can start the activities. Um, we have a review workshop which we do with them. We have onboarding exercise and we start the trade finance. You know, so we bring in a bank within five days time because we stay out. And then we have uh, email connectivity based on uh, encrypted nodal email across to the banks. And then from there we take the notes internally for these banks for transactions. And, then we get into with several banks in the blockchain initiatives, you know, which is run within the bank, and we work with those blockchain initiatives uh, working with the bank. You know, so we have a number of banks on cross-border smart contract uh, projects. We also try to make sure that their internal projects are aligned to you know the future world in terms of trade and contracting, you know, which happens. Um, so these are the options we have. Uh, we have a light touch email connectivity because the MSA between the corporate and the bank is based on old telex, fax, or maybe an email. So I don't want to wait uh, you know, till blockchain is also added into that MSA. So we have an indemnification from the customer and we can quickly dive in and start the business activity for the customer. The nodal network for the bank makes sure that you know, they have all the relevant information as within the trade or within the supply network or within the SME financing framework within uh, for the bank's range. So, um, that's uh, where we are and uh, you know, probably, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we are a customer-led blockchain connectivity platform and then, uh, you know, that ends up, you know, so, uh, if you have any questions, I can take uh, those questions and, uh, uh, as I said, we are not uh, a large company, we are like 60 guys, you know, uh, spread across, we are in Japan, we are in Africa, we are in MENA and uh, our headquarters is in Singapore. And we have a few developers in uh, India and a few in Philippines. Yeah, any questions?